Hi, I'm Ken Jacobson, Senior Documentary Programmer, AFI Festivals, and I want to welcome you to AFI Docs 2020, presented by AT&T, and to this Q&A for Bully, Coward, Victim, The Story of Roy Cohn, directed by Ivy Mirapol. First, I want to thank our supporters of the festival, our presenting sponsor, AT&T, our AFI members, and of course, you, our audience. Thank you for being here today. We're joined today by the film's director and uh, Lois Romano, who will be moderating the conversation with Ivy and is also an interviewee in the film. Just a brief word about the film. It had its world premiere at the New York Film Festival this past October, and has screened at numerous festivals since then, including Hampton Stockfest and the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. The film will be having its broadcast premiere on HBO tomorrow, June 19th, so congratulations to Ivy about that. And the film will be screening here at AFI Docs for the rest of, rest of today, so please do spread the word. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Lois Romano, who will be introducing Ivy and then conducting the Q&A. Lois Romano has had a distinguished career as a political journalist at the Washington Post, Newsweek, and Politico. She knew Roy Cohn personally and conducted one of the last interviews with the infamous lawyer before he died of AIDS. We're delighted she could join us for this important conversation with Ivy Maripal, director and producer of Bully Coward Victim, the story of Roy Cohn. Lois, thank you so much and thanks to you, Ivy, and take it away. All right, thank you, Ken. Um, I'm thrilled to be here talking to the very talented award-winning Ivy Maripol. Um, Ivy has produced and directed a number of very high impact films, uh, climate change, the final days of the Obama administration, about a nuclear power plant in New York. Um, but probably her most <laughs> gripping work has been very personal to her. Um, she has done two documentaries about convicted spies Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who were executed for treason in 1953. And what you might not know is that the Rosenbergs are Ivy's grandparents. And so she grew up knowing about them in her home and had a whole different impression of who they were. Um, her father, Michael, was one of the two orphaned boys that the Rosenbergs left behind. And it was a very powerful, sad story uh, because none of the family wanted to take them in because they were afraid of the witch hunt that had been going on. Ivy's first film about this was Heir to an Execution, which explored the legacy of her grandparents and their sensational execution. The film premiered at the 2004 Sundance Film Festival and was shortlisted for an Academy Award. Now Ivy has turned her attention and her lens to the unscrupulous lawyer, Roy Cohn, who prosecuted her grandparents. Bully Coward Victim, the story of Roy Cohn, explores how Cohn, a tortured man himself, ruthlessly went after the Rosenbergs. History would later show that Julius was a spy and Ethel likely would have been aware of her husband's activities. But the ultimate punishment that the couple received did not fit the crime. So Ivy, I'm very excited to be here with you. And the film was absolutely fabulous. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Lois. <laughs> um, before we dive into Cohen, let's talk a little bit about your journey. Your father and his brother were orphaned as young boys. They spent decades trying to prove their parents' innocence. When did you know that this was a story you wanted to tell? Well, um, if we're going back to what prompted me to um, make Air to an Execution, that what you know, so I will, I mean, to go further back, my, uh, when I was very young, I, I knew exactly what had happened to my grandparents. I didn't know why, but I knew that they had been executed and I knew that um, my father and my uncle had been orphaned um, as very young boys. And I, so, you know, growing up with that, I, I knew that at some point I was gonna, I would want to know more about. And the, what precipitated um, getting in, into, you know, making heir to an execution was that it really, the story started to weigh on me, wanting to know who they were, you know, as real human beings, you know, the, the, you know, the story I grew up with um, was that they were 
pure innocent martyrs because that's what we believed as a family and that's what their supporters really believed. And and then on the flip side were many people who believed that they were they were ultimate evil, that they had done this terrible, terrible crime and um, giving the secret of the atom bomb to the Soviet Union. Both of those stories didn't quite give me enough um, to live with almost. I mean, it was kind of, you know, that I just kept wondering, well, what what was worth standing up for so much that it was worth leaving my father, my uncle? Because I always looked at it through the perspective of, I thought about my dad more than I, I mean, you know, now I know, you know, as an adult in retrospect, I can look back that really I identified with my father as being a young boy that this happened to. So it was more my concern for him and why they had made those decisions than it was being able to quite understand them. They seemed further away. So I think that has really informed my, um, my approach, how I look, how I look at the story. So that's, that was Erdogan Execution and that came out in 2004. And I really didn't think that I was going to revisit my family's story ever again. You know, you make a film like that and it's very painful, took a long time, very, you know, really scary, wanted to give up at times because family members wouldn't talk to me, but I, but I did, but I pursued it and I got through it. I, I reconciled how I fit. I, I understood it more now. And, you know, Roy Cohn being a figure who I certainly knew, um, knew his name, um, but didn't really think much about it. I mean, he was kind of like part of the, the larger cast of characters of evildoers in my family's story, who included, you know, everyone from the judge, Irving Kaufman, to J. Edgar Hoover. You know, I just thought, well, these are, these are our enemies. And I left it at that. Um, what we talk about in the film, as those, you know, everyone has seen it now, the title Bully, Coward, Victim comes from the AIDS quilt. It was the, the massive uh, names project, which was the AIDS quilt that was spread ac across the Smithsonian Mall. My father and I had visited it in, um, oh gosh, I'm gonna, in 1988, I think, and um, I was in college. The first panel we stumbled upon was, it said, bully, coward, victim, Roy Cohn. I didn't know, at the time, I didn't know he was gay, and I didn't know he had died of AIDS. So I, that, that really planted this idea in my head that I want to know more about this person. Um, obviously, he's much more complicated than just being, having been the prosecutor, uh, one of the prosecutors in my grandparents' trial. So that stayed with me. Then we fast forward all these years, Donald Trump is elected. And I really thought, okay, this is this is a time to tell this story. He's and still it, and around. <laughs> yeah, his ghost he's still is still around. And it's, <laughs> exactly, and it's important that we that we as a country, as the, you know, the world, understand him, know more about him, and know and and how he helped us get to where we are now. And uh, it became imperative for me again to to revisit my family story as a way to tell the cone story and the, and by being and then get to trump obviously anyway sorry <laughs> long-winded <laughs> he's really a guy who's had so many lives i mean you know when you think about how many times um he was disgraced i mean you know from the the commie hunt with joe mccarthy you know and then you know you come you move fast forward and he was um, he was a lawyer to the mob and then you move fast forward and he's given us as you say donald trump yeah how do you think he survived all these years i mean um i mean until until his death i mean he only got disbarred right before he died how did he survive and and keep being near power and a power broker after all the things he had done. Yeah, no, he's, he's remarkable. And in, in the way that he would, I mean, as, as, as you say in the film, so aptly, you know, he rose from the ashes out of the ashes, you rose, you know, I mean, and, and what we're talking about is that, you know, after the army McCarthy hearings, when he is completely disgraced, he leaves DC, he's still very young and you think, well, this guy's finished. Um, well, what he, he was very smart. Uh, he was very smart. He was very connected. He knew from an early, early age that um, the so-called favor bank was going to serve him well. And he was going to always be making those connections and being opportunistic and, and you know, working his, you know, I think 
you know, people felt beholden to him. He, he made that happen. I mean, he started when he first got back to New York city after being in Washington, he, he immediately started a practice where he, you know, would help, you know, the, the children of very, um, well-connected and powerful people, you know, get off from like a drunk driving, um, charges and things like that. So they're indebted. People become indebted to him. And I think he also was really, really clever at, at just collecting such a range of people in his life so that he always had, you know, whether it was, you know, he's hanging out with Bianca Jagger or he's hanging out with George Steinbrenner or, you know, Nancy Reagan. Nancy Reagan. <laughs> right, right, everybody. He, would just, right. he was transactional, right? I mean, he was a transactional yes. guy. Yeah. He was a transactional guy. And I think he also, he says it in the, you know, there's, um, I think it's Tom Snyder has asked him, you know, what, what do you get when you get a Roy Tony? He says, scare value. So, you know, there's another, that's another aspect of how I think he, I mean, he, it was not a coincidence that he cultivated those relationships with the mob um, so that um, he could, he could wield that kind of, that kind of power too. Um, one of the, one of the, more heartbreaking uh, stories um, in your film is uh, how, and I think you touch it here and you also, in the first film, is how your um, grandmother's brother testified against them. Um, James um, Greenglass testified okay. against his sister. I'm sorry? Yeah. No, I yeah. just, David Greenglass, it's David. Oh, it's David. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. David Greenglass testified against his sister and Julius. And what's very interesting there is that in his grand jury testimony, which was not um, released until 40, 50 years later, he, did, he insisted that Ethel was not guilty, that she had nothing to do with it. But then he got to trial and she became guilty. And that's where I think Roy Cohen comes in, correct? Yes, you're absolutely right. Roy Cohen helped plants, you know, I, we don't know, you know, if it was Roy came up with the idea himself, he probably didn't, I think, you know, but, but he was a major architect in that plan to create a story that where Ruth and David Greenglass would testify that Ethel did the typing. And what they mean by, what they meant by that was just that simply some notes that supposedly Julius had brought into the home that she, she typed them up to be, you know, trans transmitted to their contacts, um, their supposed Soviet contacts. And, you know, David Greenglass admitted many years later um, on 60 Minutes in Disguise, and we show a little clip of that um, remarkable interview in the film also, where he admitted, you know, I don't know if anybody did that. Nobody did the typing. You know, he did not, he, he admitted that Cone created, and that was the, that was the most damning evidence that so-called evidence that was presented in the trial against Ethel. We also know that uh, the judge really wavered, Judge Kaufman was really wavering once they were convicted and they were convicted of uh, conspiracy to commit espionage. They actually were not even convicted of treason. treason. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, you know, but, but this is, um, you know, this shows exactly like the climate of the times that they, were, they have now gone down in history as traitors when they really were, they were convicted and then executed for conspiracy to commit espionage, which is not the same high level of um, and uh, never gave to, away to big proof. secrets, right? I mean, no, never and they gave never away. Really gave secrets, yeah. Well, and Ethel, we know, wasn't involved. I mean, you know, whether she knew what Julius was up to or not, we will never know. And I'm, you know, she probably did know because they were very close. That does not mean that she was a spy. She was never given a code name. Um, all of the information we've learned since, you know, shows that yes, Julius was uh, involved in low-level espionage. He did have a code name. Um, Ethel did not. You know, Cohn knew this, but Cohn pressure pushed Kaufman to um, give her the death sentence. You know, he he really, you know, he. I mean, we can really look at him as a. You know, I mean, and all these years later after making Erdogan Execution, you know, where I used to think David Greenglass was the worst, you know, in our story, you know, how could a brother do this? I have more empathy now for David Greenglass because I understand what pressure he was under and I understand, you know, how, how um, Cohn pushed him and scared the hell out of him and said, you know, you and your wife are going to go to the electric chair if you don't cooperate. Um, it's, you know, we look at the story 
now, you really see that Roy Cohn is is the villain much more so than David or Ruth Greenglass. Did you ever meet your great uncle? I know he only died in 2014. No, no, never did. Uh, he never wanted anything to do with me or any of us. Um, and I tried gently, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't harass him, but during, when I was making Air to an Execution, I wrote him a letter and asked if he'd even be willing to talk to me off, you know, off the record, off camera, just, you know, just to meet. I mean, I was becoming very curious about this whole side of my family um, who, you know, who we never got to know. And uh, no, I, I was told David has no interest, leave him alone. Mm -hmm. He, he yeah. needed to bury it, didn't he? Well, he they li they lived under an assumed name the whole you know yeah. the whole time. Yeah, I didn't realize yeah. That. yeah yeah his own grandchildren didn't know who he actually was which is a very interesting contrast to what our lives were like wow. compared to them yeah <laughs> well he was embarrassed I saw somewhere where in right before the execution he tried to appeal uh, to Eisenhower to stay it um, which I thought was fascinating considered he had just um, really sentenced them himself. Yeah. Um, so I learned a lot about Roy Cohen and from this movie, and I thought I knew quite a bit, and um, he was such a public person, but he had secrets, and while most of us knew he was gay, um, he never came out of the closet, and yet you found some really interesting um, graphics of videos and, and still pictures. How did you come across those? Well, um, so it's it's a great story, and I can't wait to be able to share who exactly had, um, you know, who was who who had um, in, who was in possession of such incredible materials. But I can't yet because he hasn't given me permission to just yet. But I will tell you that what happened was we had for for the whole almost two years of making this film, my team and I um, had we were obsessed with the fact that we had discovered that the Swan Auction Galleries, auction house in New York City, which is a big auction house, um, had sold um, a particular lot of, you know, a personal, we didn't know exactly what was in it, but it had been described as Roy Cohn's personal effects, you know, and personal photographs and all sorts of memorabilia and, and um, and we could not discover, but the person who had bought it wished to remain anonymous. So the auction house wouldn't tell us who it was. We, um, we tried everything to discover, you know, find out. I mean, I tried, um, you know, I tried getting in touch with Cy Newhouse's widow and children um, because uh, Cohn was famous and very, very close friends with Cy Newhouse. I thought, well, maybe the Newhouse family bought this mm -hmm. archive because they wanted to keep Roy close. Um, or control these things. Couldn't find it, couldn't find it. We had, we're just about finishing the film. We were actually locked the picture. We were in the color correction when I found the person who, um, who owns this archive, who is a celebrity, who's a wonderful artist. Um, and, and it was an he, accident, right? I mean, it was just an accident. It was an accident. Because you needed to talk to this particular person about yeah. something else. Right. Exactly. That's I needed amazing. to talk to. Yeah. I needed to talk about something else, and wound up where he said, "Oh, by the way, I have this. I you might be interested. I have a few things of Roy's, and it turned out to be the actual archive. And then he very generously let us use use this material. And what you see in the Provincetown section, of, in particular, are these." beautiful Polaroids because they're just so intimate and they're so, you know, you see Roy in a way that nobody ever really saw him. Um, I mean, maybe, you know, his close friends or people who saw him in Provincetown or places like that would see him that way. But just, he, he's, that that's the Roy um, who was not, you know, the one, the one who did that not Roy go down. Not in the closet. We, we, <laughs> <Right>. uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, that, that was amazing yeah. footage. I mean, he is in Provincetown and he's, and he's um, mm -hmm. hanging around with all his other gay friends and, and he is posing for the pictures yes. and um, he must have had some confidence they would never come forward. Um, that was amazing. Uh, I think, I, yeah. The other no, thing I was going to say, but I, I, I think he, obviously, I was, Sorry, I was just okay. thinking that that he probably that he saved those photos, which tells you something also that he 
that those were meaningful to him. That Cone saved that, yeah. Imagine having to live your life, you know, in, in such secret and being, you know, outwardly a conservative Republican and having this whole other secret life. I mean, I don't know how, how people could do it, but he was a duplicitous guy, so maybe it came um, easy to him. Um, the other question I had for you is when I saw the film, I, I came away with, with a little bit of sympathy for him. And I was surprised because it was you doing the film. Um, tell me a little bit about what you wanted to portray in the end. Sure. Um, you know, it was a, it was, I set out to make this film with the, with, with the, with a concerted effort to work against my own anger at Cohn and my own preconceived notions of Cohn. So I, you know, I felt like, you know, I'm not going to spend all this time making a film and try to do a real deep dive into someone's life if I'm just going to dismiss them right off the bat as evil. You know, I mean, it's just then it's there's there's nothing to work with. There's no story. There's no and it wouldn't I, I just wouldn't be interested. So I had to go back to that feeling I had when I first when my father and I first stumbled on his the panel at the AIDS quilt, which was a combination of, you know, oh, wow, Roy Cohn, I like good that bastard. He you know, like the, that feeling because he really is such an um, evil figure in our um, in our in our lives or he always had been. So but then I thought. Well, oh, actually, the poor bastard. <laughs> you know, there, there. You know, it was a, just a combination of those two feelings that I wanted to continue to hold onto as I made the film, and so I was constantly looking for ways to try to understand how he could have become. You know, how he became the monster, really, that that he was. By you know, he's really. I think he had trouble identifying as a Jew, even though he would say how proud he was and how pro-Israel he was. But I think that was very complicated for him, but um, even more so being gay and, and, how, and what that does to a person. And to try to have empathy for someone who um, had to live such a secret life and who really, and who, and who openly despised who he really, who he actually was. So, you know, someone who fights against gay rights and who allies himself with Cardinal Spellman and all these other like vicious anti-gay figures, powerful figures, um, you know, what is, who is that person? You know, so I, self -loathing. I did, mm -hmm. yeah, self-loathing. So, um, you know, people have asked how, how could I call him a victim? You know, they think, well, we get bullied, we get coward, or, you know, right now who feels like they can't come out to their family, you are, you are a victim of societal bigotry. You just are, and you know, and you know, not to mention he died of AIDS, which is also being a victim, you know, of a terrible disease. So it doesn't mean we forgive him. It just, I think, it's important to recognize what that does to people to have to live that kind of lie. Was there anything I, that shocked you about him? Anything that shocked you about him? that you um, expect to find? Anything that shocked me? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I honestly did not know until your amazing reporting became part of my reporting. Um, I did not know how much he had really taken Trump under his wing and brought very specifically introduced him to Washington. I knew he had been, they'd been friends. I knew he'd been the family lawyer. I knew he'd been, knew he'd been his mentor. And um, I kind of just focused, I always just looked at them as these New York City pals, right? The fact that he, I mean, you pinpoint, I mean, I feel like that's a real, that's a real discovery is that he is the person who first got Trump thinking I could be in Washington. I could be a figure on the national and international stage. I could be the nuclear arms negotiator. <laughs> and and you know so that that was very very surprising um yeah, yeah it was that amazing was <laughs> and, and after he um got aids and most people knew it although he wouldn't admit it um trump actually shunned him um yes. which was kind of sad he, um, yes. he he was very close to him for a long time and then it was a stigma in the 80s but it was a very sad story i think for roy um, I think so too. And, you know, I, I could even feel for him in that regard. And, you know, he, 
um, he did so much for Trump. And there's, there's a couple of very subtle, poignant moments in, in our film, especially like when you see the scene where um, suddenly Trump is now in the receiving line at the White House next to the Reagans, right? And then there's Roy being kind of ushered along quickly as Trump is, is getting to be in pride of place, you know, next to the Reagans. And there's Cone now relegated to just being, you know, another person being shooed along quickly. Um, I just, you know, I thought, well, there's, there, 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 that's, that's one of those moments. He, tra he transferred yeah, his You really power. notice, yeah. I mean, that's what's so great about film, that he transfer his power, that's right. And then um, he did abandon him. Um, and we used to say in that when we were in the edit room and we, you know, we were working on these Trump sections, they're like, wow, we really, there is someone worse than Roy Cohn and his name is Donald Trump. You know? <laughs> um, I want to go back to something you said in the beginning of this conversation, <laughs> um, which is you said that you, you, saw, you saw all this through the lens of your father. And, um, and, and you know, why, uh, whether your grandmother should have taken a deal. Can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, as a, as a parent um, and as someone familiar, I mean, p parents watch this movie and they think, well, why didn't she just take some sort of a deal so she wouldn't leave her children? And did you ever judge her on that or did you come to terms with it? Um, I don't know if I ever judged her, but I questioned it. I, that, was a, that was something that was very... Um, difficult in um, making air gun execution and beyond just just ha grappling with that and I think it was a question that that really drove me to want to know more about who they were as people it's like I wanted reassurance that you know that they cared about my father and uncle um, and that you know that it was that they weren't so um, ideological and caught up you know that they that they would be able to separate from from them so um so willingly it seemed i mean this is you know my my limited understanding at the time so i i think that i really did want to know um uh what who they were so that i could understand why that that decision was made i, I we i've come to the conclusion that they really that she in particular didn't have a choice in the sense that they she would have had to um separate from Julius to do that she would have had they wouldn't have been able to, you know they were so what I learned about them was how how much they were in this together what you know and that doesn't mean that I think that she was like you know she was a spy also but that they they cared about each other so much and she was we have to remember she was brought in to use as leverage you know she was brought in she was arrested to try to break Julius and the two of them together, instead of that happening, they actually became stronger in their, in their um, you know, uh, resistance. And I think, you know, I can't, I, I've also come to terms with the fact that I can't know how I would, how I would behave in this under these circumstances, or how, I don't think any of us can. And it's important to let go of trying to, trying to think of like, what would we do in that situation? Because how, how can we know? I mean, the, the context of the times, what they, what they cared about, what they dreamed about, um, who they were, that's, I, I can't, I can't try to imagine that. So, you know, when I, you know, at times when I used to think, well, um, how could they leave their children? I could never do something like that. Um, I think it's more important to try to understand who they were in the context of their times. Right. Now, so you've done these two incredibly illuminating films um, about your family and what happened and now in Roy Cohn. Um, do you see yourself uh, doing anything further in this? <laughs> um, not, no, not about our family, I don't think. I mean, I, you know, I, I certainly, you know, like I was saying earlier, I, I, I resisted myself getting you know doing another film that that brought my family um to the fore i just didn't i just felt like i've done it i don't want to keep doing it but i think what has ha what happened here is that it became it, i knew there was a reason to tell their to bring to to tell their story again in a different way um there was a reason it's because of cone and it's because of trump but i you know who knows maybe there'll be some other something that comes up but i 
um, you know, I, I wouldn't mind, uh, you know, having a fictionalized version of the cone story out there. I, I would be, help work on that. And same with, same with my grandparents' story. I mean, I think a real, you know, a narrative, a scripted series or a, or a film um, about them is, is overdue. I think that would be a great story just to know a little bit more about them as people because yes. they were so demonized. Exactly. Um, well, Ivy, this was a great conversation and thank you so much for this film. Um, it's just a great film and, um, and thank you for this conversation and good luck with it. Thank you, Lois. And it's a real treat to have turned the tables and have you interview me this time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you.